Hello, and welcome to our program, Astronomy for Everyone. Our topic for this month's show is the Moon. And here with us to talk about some interesting aspects of the Moon is our special guest, Dr. Nicole Zellner, Professor of Physics from Albion College. Dr. Zellner, welcome to the program. Well, thanks for having me. This is really exciting. Glad to have you here. So, uh, let's start off by filling in our viewers a little bit on your professional background. Sure, sure. Uh, well, I grew up in Wisconsin and uh, where, uh, did my undergraduate at the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And then um, almost immediately after I graduated, I was part of the ground team for STS-67, which was a space shuttle mission dedicated to ultraviolet astronomy. And that really it planted the bug in my brain about wanting to go to graduate school and then get an advanced degree and really make um, some inroads into the space business. Um, the mentors that I had at Wisconsin were fabulous and working with the astronauts and teaching them and training them on how to use our telescopes while they were in space and then actually taking that data and making it available for the astronomers was really, um, really special for me. So um, after, I, after that mission was over and the funding ended, I went to graduate school in upstate New York at Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute, where I had my first introduction to lunar samples. Um, I did a postdoc at Lawrence Livermore National Lab in California and then came to Albion in 2005. And that's where you are? And that is where yeah. I am today. Yes. And uh, do you do, besides teaching, are there other things at Albion that, uh, that you do? Uh, sure. I am the astronomer on campus, and so I am, um, I guess, more or less responsible for uh, public observing sessions, um, meeting with prospective students, uh, mentoring undergraduates in research projects, especially those who want to go to graduate school. Um, and um, I also am funded by NASA and the National Science Foundation to conduct research related to um, uh, impacts in our solar system. That's the broad topic. Oh, okay. All right. Interesting. So uh, you've been in the field for a while. Uh, what type of programs or projects have you worked on or are working on? Sure. So um, my, my, as I said, my broad research area interest is impacts in the solar system. And what, what did they deliver? How often did they occur? Were they mostly asteroid dominated, comet dominated? And, and kind of, you know, how our inner solar system has been affected um, since uh, it was formed four and a half billion years ago. So my main research project is understanding lunar impact glasses, which are microscopic pieces of glass that are formed in impact events. So just like we get glass by melting sand on Earth, we get an impact glass when an asteroid hits the lunar surface and then melts that regolith or that lunar dirt into these little glass beads. Interesting, interesting. I hadn't really thought about that, but oh, okay. So that is, um, that's, the one, that's the one project. And so okay. I, an, I analyze these impact glasses. I'm interested in their composition and I'm interested in their formation age and what that might tell us about the impact flux in the inner solar system, whether it was um, a, a, a smooth decline over time or whether there were sporadic fits and starts in the impact rate. And the lunar impact glasses that are formed in these impact events possess a memory of the age or the time when they are formed, and so we can measure how old they are, and then that helps us fill in that timeline. How interesting. It's pretty cool. Yeah. It's, it's yeah. really interesting because on Earth, we have important and interesting biological and geological events happening like water, continents, first life, extinctions. So if we can understand what the impact flux is, then we can get a better sense of the conditions that all these things ha were happening on Earth. So I, sh I should back up a step. Um, we, we don't have evidence of a lot of impacts on Earth because it's 75% water, because there's plate tectonics, because there's an atmosphere, but the moon, which is our closest neighbor, re records almost all of the impacts that have occurred on it for four and a half billion years. So we use the moon as a proxy for understanding the impact rate on the Earth. The moon Earth. has no erosion. No erosion, mm. no plate tectonics, no water uh, to speak of. Uh, so it preserves a record of all of the craters for, that are very, very old. Interesting, interesting. Yeah, so that's one of the projects. Okay. The other project, which is a little bit more interdisciplinary and has allowed me to collaborate with a chemist at Albion College, Vanessa McCaffrey, um, have, has us understanding what happens to a very simple sugar called glycol aldehyde under uh, uh, shock conditions or impact conditions. 
uh, so glycolaldehyde is a, a two carbon sugar that's been observed pretty much everywhere in space, including in situ on the comet um, P67 in 2015. And so we know that comets impacted the Earth, and we know now that glycolaldehyde is, is on comets, and so we we're we're wanna understand um, does glycolaldehyde uh, decompose or does it become more complex during that impact event? And what we're finding is that glycolaldehyde actually becomes more complex. It turns into four carbon sugars and five carbon sugar, which is ribose, of course, is the backbone for DNA and RNA. So we're helping to understand kind of the conditions and delivery of some of the first biomolecules um, on our planet. And, that, and that's a really more chemistry intensive project. And so we've been able to incorporate a lot of chemistry undergrads at Albion in that project. It's been really fun. That's, that's interesting. All of these, you think just about an impact, okay, blows a bunch of stuff into the air. I'm right. oversimplifying, of course. But uh, the science behind it is, is, is really quite fascinating. Well, I, for you know, Carl Sagan and Chris Chiba back in the um, early, uh, Carl Sagan especially in the early 1970s and then later on with Chris Chiba, proposed that organic molecules, which we started to observe in meteorites, would never survive a comet impact or would never survive an asteroid impact. But we're showing through um, these kinds of experiments where we um, um, simulate an impact with a, with a we use a flat plate accelerator at, at Johnson Space Center in Houston, but under other kinds of impact gone accelerator conditions, these molecules don't necessarily get destroyed. You know, they, 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 some of them do get reduced in simplicity, but some of them actually become more complex. And so we're showing that, and, and survive intact. So we're showing that these biomolecules can very well have been delivered uh, by asteroids or comets over time, um, biomolecules that are, are necessary for life as we know it. And, and that's kind of a cool idea that you have the endogenous production at hydrothermal vents or in warm little ponds, but you also have the exogenous delivery by the asteroids and comets. And so under the right conditions then, we got the first cells and you know, eventually us. <laughs> so it was both here on Earth, and we were talking about the hydrothermal vents that we can observe today, and then coming from space, combining here in those special areas, those little tidal pools. That's my, that's my story and I'm sticking to it. Um, there are certainly people who are all on one or all on the other, but you know, I, 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 I don't want to exclude any ideas because we weren't, we weren't there, right? So, right. <laughs> um, and I think both, both scenarios uh, are, are valid. Still sort of playing out, uh, looking for more information perhaps to, to see if it goes one way or the other or Will it be both, I guess? I mean, it's well, I mean, certainly, uh, so glycolaldehyde, this two-carbon sugar, it's, it's an important um, starting material for the foremost reaction, which makes ribose, and also for Strecker's synthesis, which leads to amino acids. So we have to have glycolaldehyde in the mix. Okay. But we haven't been able, that I know of, to figure out what the conditions were like on the early Earth for that glycolaldehyde to be there. We haven't found it in, in our very oldest rocks on Earth, right? So the theory that Vanessa and I are putting forth is that the comets are almost a constant source of delivery for this, for this, um, this sugar, which becomes important in the biochemistry that, that, that eventually will lead to life. Plus, they think a lot of the water that is here came from space. Yes, mostly from asteroid. Uh, delivery, I think, is 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 the is the direction that people are leaning. Though we haven't surveyed nearly enough comets to really rule out comet delivery. But the ones that we do have that we have observed, they don't have the right kind of water chemistry that we observe um, today. Very interesting. So anyway, that's a whole other <laughs> that's a whole other segment. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're going to take a uh, quick break. Uh, if you have a question, please send us an email. You can see our address down there at the bottom of your screen. And coming up next is Stephen with Term of the Month, and after that, we'll be back. The Term of the Month is regolith. Regolith is, was defined in 1897 by George P. Merrill. He used the two Greek words, regos, meaning blanket, and lithos, meaning rock. So regolith is a covering of the rock. On the moon, Regolith forms from bombardment of objects striking the moon at speeds of up to 60,000 miles per hour. It covers most of the rock 
uh, on the moon with just a little bit of rock sticking out on steep crater walls and some lava channels. <clears throat> the chemical composition is estimated from relative concentration of elements that have been measured. The impactors and the native rock form the materials that become the regolith. Silicon and oxygen, the two on the left, are the most abundant and, heat, and when they are heated by the impacts can form glass. Melting and refreezing forms jagged glass and small beads which act as little retroreflectors. These beads can make the full moon be six times as bright as either of the two quarters instead of approximately twice as bright just by area. The lunar regolith is defined as having grain sizes from a centimeter, half an inch, down to 30 micrometers, which is fine dust. Astronauts say it tastes like gunpowder and sticks to everything. Space weathering darkens the regolith after uh, some time passes. So the bright crater rays that you see are from young craters. And that's regolith, the term of the month. Welcome back. We're here with Dr. Nicole Zellner from Albion College talking about the moon. But we're going to get a little bit more specific than that. We're going to talk about moon rocks. Sure. Yeah. Moon rocks. So exciting. Moon rocks. And why don't they call it moon soil? Uh, okay. <laughs> so uh, I'm not a biologist. I'm not an ecologist. Um, but okay. I, I believe it's because there are no microbes that will actually make nutrients or leave nutrients behind. Um, so people do call it soil. Of course, it's not soil. Um, there, there, there are no organics, measurable organics, or maybe none at all in the regolith. Um, it's, it's, the regolith is a, a term used for a, pulver, a surface that's been pulverized to a very fine powder over billions of years. And so certainly because the moon has no water um, and it, its surface it has been solid for, for billions of years. And then as um, uh, asteroids and comets have hit, hit it over time, it's, it's, it's become this very fine powder, okay. which is regolith. Which, okay, just yeah. to give it that particular term to differentiate it from soil. Sure. All right. Yeah. So uh, you've been studying moon rocks and, and soil? Right. My specialty is actually lunar impact glass, which are microscopic pieces of glass um, that you can actually find in the regolith. I've looked at um, four different Apollo regolith samples from uh, 14, 15, 16, and 17. And from that material, extracted out these impact glasses that then helped me um, contribute to an understanding of what the impact flux is in the Earth-Moon system. Also in that, in that regolith are volcanic glasses. And these are um, pycritic glasses that have actually um, erupted from the interior of the moon when it was volcanically active. So uh, when uh, Jack Schmidt's um, exclamation of orange glass, orange glass, it's there, do you see it, do you see it? I'm paraphrasing, but yeah. mm -hmm. it's a very famous um, line from him, line, mine's not the word, reaction from him. Yes. Um, and so it's those orange glasses that he found at the Apollo 17 site that actually erupted from the interior probably about 3.6, 3.7 billion years ago. So these volcanic glasses then um, allowed us to begin to investigate the interior composition of the moon and also when the moon was volcanically active and to what depth. Okay. So those are the um, two special kinds of, of glasses that I look at, but also in that regolith are very tiny microscopic rocks um, that have been pulverized over billions of years from much larger ones. Um, there are some um, metals in it. Um, there's even some evidence of some of the impactor material in, in the regolith as well. So it's, 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 a, lot of, it's a lot of stuff in, the, in that regolith. So the impactor would be a different type of material than what we assume was here on the early Earth? Be able to tell the difference, I guess? Oh, for sure. Okay. Yeah, I mean, um, the, the, the metal in particular from the, um, from the impactor uh, may have survived that impact. And so we, have, uh, we can use isotopes and other kinds of chemistry and chemical cues or clues to um, understand what the difference is uh, between something that's coming from the Earth, something that's coming from the Moon, something that's coming from an asteroid. 
Okay. Right, right. So for example, this is a lunar meteorite. So this is a thin section of a lunar meteorite. Um, it was collected in Northwest Africa here on Earth, but we know it came from the moon. Um, it has uh, little uh, uh, inclusions in it, the, 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 the white uh, inclusions in there. It tells us it's a feldspathic meteorite, so higher in aluminum and calcium than it is in um, iron and titanium, for example. Okay. And we actually had lunar meteorites in our collection. Uh, prior to the Apollo astronauts returning samples or bringing samples to the Earth, we just didn't know they were lunar. Um, and then when we got the actual lunar samples and, and people started investigating their compositions, they realized that they had very similar rocks sitting on a shelf. I'm, I'm being a little... Uh, um, loose with my work with my description there and and somebody said went over and said this looks a lot like what the Apollo astronauts brought back and sure enough it was a lunar meteorite and that's when they realized what they were and not just something else from the from somewhere else yeah, yeah exactly exactly. Okay. exactly so so that's pretty special um, uh, it's of course it's illegal to actually have uh, Apollo rocks in your possession, um, but lunar meteorites are for sale um, all on, on all sorts of markets. Okay. And so I bought this from um, a meteorite dealer. I have a collection that I use for my classes. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. And the Johnson Space Center has um, educational samples as well that they loan out to, um, to, to people who are, are, are qualified and certified. Okay. So I also bring those into my classroom. So yeah, there's a, a protocol then for being able to have these uh, yes. samples. Yes, yes, yeah. So I actually have to apply to what's called the um, CAPTEM team, the Lunar Subcommittee of CAPTEM. CAPTEM is the Curation Analysis and Planning Team for Extraterrestrial Materials. Um, the Lunar Subcommittee reviews proposals twice a year. They evaluate the proposals for scientific merit as well as um, abundance of the material in the collection as well as whether or not the, um, um, the, the scientific method is destructive. And so they, okay. they use those three uh, criteria to um, determine who gets how much of what sample. Do you have an idea how much lunar rock we have brought back? Is 842 pounds, uh, which is somewhere around 360 kilograms, okay. um, was brought to Earth by the Apollo astronauts. And um, I think the last number I heard is roughly 70 to 70% 70 of them are still in pristine condition. Um, so what's very exciting is this year or early next year, uh, scientific teams in the United States are gonna open a core uh, as well as a frozen sample that, be, that has been isolated since uh, 1972. Uh, so it'll almost be like we have a new sample from the moon. Um, and so they're, they're going to be very careful in how they open up the tube. A lot of people are interested in the volatiles, um, any, uh, um, any water or, uh, or ice that may still have existed uh, once it was collected, um, and other sorts of things. So, so we have 50 years of experience now. We're smarter, our instruments are better, and, and they want to get into these, these untouched samples. Uh, to test things that we now know exist in the lunar samples or to test other hypotheses with samples that have never been or ra very, li li very little exposure to, to terrestrial environment. Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Right, so, so that's going to be very exciting. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. So with the samples that we've looked at so far, have, I guess what have we learned? What conclusions have we drawn so far? Oh, lots, so many. Um, first of all, uh, one of the big conclusions is that we know that the moon was formed during an impact with the Earth. Uh, so when the uh, Apollo samples were analyzed, they realized that these Apollo samples had a composition that was very similar to the Earth. And then, of course, we know from observation that the moon uh, orbits around the Earth at an inclined angle, not in the equatorial plane. Right. And so by pu putting together some of the physics, some of the chemistry, we realize that a Mars-sized object most likely collided with the Earth very early in, the, in solar system formation, and then de the debris from that um, collision formed the moon that we know today. So that was really exciting. Um, I mentioned the volcanic glasses. We also have um, what, what's called basalt, mari basalt from the moon. And so this allows us then to um, measure 
uh, the composition and the timing of lunar volcanism. All the very dark patches that we see on the near side of the moon, those are lava-filled or mare-filled impact basins. So we know that the moon was volcanically active. Uh, we have impact material, so we know that almost every single crater we see on the moon was formed by an impact, by an impactor. Mm -hmm. um, and that helped us really better understand the impact craters that we see on Earth. Um, we, we have found water in the lunar samples, so we know that there was just a little bit of water on the moon. Uh, we're still debating the origin of that water, um, and there's not a whole lot of it, uh, but it, it's not as bone dry as we thought it was. Okay, of course they've talked about finding water buried in the bottoms of the craters at the south lunar pole. Ah, uh, so in the permanently shadowed regions of the yes. craters at the south and north pole. Oh, and the north pole as yes. well? Yes, okay. yeah, yep, yep, okay. and so that's all part of um, the future of human exploration and whether or not we can extract that water, turn it into oxygen, turn it into a fuel, and then uh, create propellant at the moon that we can then use to explore the rest of the solar system. Interesting. Uh, what you happen to know, talking about the water, just, just thinking, there's different isotopes of water. Is what we find on the moon the same that we have here? Uh, that's a good question. I don't know. I'd have don't to go. Okay. I'd have to okay. go back in the papers okay. <laughs> and see that. So <laughs> we've we've learned an awful lot about the Earth's ancient history by studying yes. these rocks. Yeah. And. Um, well, the Earth's ancient impact history. Impact history. Right. right. Sure. I mean, certainly um, people think they talk about um, the moon being Earth's attic and if the Earth got a nice big impactor. So when you think about the gravity of the two bodies, for every object hitting the moon, um, there should be 20 of them hitting the Earth because just the Earth has a larger gravitational pull. So, and if those things are big enough and the material can do so, it will escape Earth's gravitational field and land on the moon. So some people are thinking that they might be able to find ancient Earth material, as you um, stated, on the moon. But trying to find that, I think, is going to be really, really hard. Yeah, I mean, we're just in a little spot, and yeah, trying to find that versus finding these uh, lunar meteorites. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. What do you hope to find in the future that you haven't found so far? Oh wow! What do I hope to find in the future that I haven't found? One of the really interesting. Um, uh, studies that's being done with these with this these new samples um, is whether or not uh, they preserve any amino acids or any organic material. Um, previous tests of the lunar material for organics like this was inconclusive. Were inconclusive because they couldn't rule out contamination from the um, lunar landers themselves and the rovers. Okay. And so by looking at stuff now um, that's been preserved and by better understanding that that contamination, maybe they can find organic material that's been preserved um, in the cores uh, below the surface. So these are um, cores that have been taken meters down. So whether or not you can find that there. So that's kind of exciting. Um, and that's a, that's a team at NASA Goddard that's doing that. Okay, well, we'll have to uh, stay apprised, I suppose, and sure. see what, what we find out. Okay. I would really like to thank my guest uh, for being here uh, today, Dr. Nicole Zellner from Albion College, to talk to us about moon rocks and regolith. Uh, we'd like to invite you to visit our club website. Uh, the address is down there at the bottom of your screen. And coming up next with What's Up in the Night Sky is Stephen. Thanks, Don. What's up in the night sky for August 2019? We've passed the summer solstice, so the days are getting shorter in the northern hemisphere. Um, so the sun goes from 6.26 a.m. to 6.57 a.m. Uh, for sunrise. For sunset, it goes from uh, 8.52 to 8.09, so the days are shortening. The nights are getting longer, and astronomical night is about two hours after sunset, until about two hours before sunrise. First quarter is on the 7th. The full moon is on the 15th. The third quarter is on the 23rd, and the new moon is on the 30th. Now, in this Ori picture, 
uh, we can see that in the upper left-hand corner, uh, the inner planets, which goes out to Mars, the terrestrial planets, really, um, they happen to be all in the same general direction. And they also are also in the same general direction as the sun. So they're really awful, really awful all month. But I'll go through them shortly. Uh, the, other, the outer planets are then uh, visible all night, and they're gorgeous. So Mercury um, goes from Gemini to Leo over the month, and it rises at 526 to, 5, uh, to 638, which is actually quite close to sunrise. Uh, on the 9th, it has max western elongation. It's farthest away from the sun, but it's not very good, uh, even so. Venus uh, goes from Cancer to Leo over the month and rises uh, a little after 608, um, which is barely before sunrise. Um, on the 14th, it undergoes superior conjunction where it crosses uh, behind the sun. And Mars is in Leo, and it sets from uh, 921 to 810. But on September 2nd, it's approaching superior conjunction uh, because the Earth rotates around, uh, orbits around the sun a little faster than Mars does, so it actually catches up. Jupiter is in Ophiuchus and sets from 2.20 in the morning to 20 minute, 24 minutes after midnight. Um, Saturn is in the teaspoon of Sagittarius and sets from 4.35 a.m. to 2.28 a.m. And Pluto is relatively near Saturn, sets from 4.59 to 2.58 a.m. If you want to see Pluto, you need a better sky chart than this, and you need a 10-inch telescope or bigger. A uh, bigger diameter is better. And, uh, but Saturn might actually make it easier to star hop into the little stars that are nearest Pluto to spot it. Uh, this is about the best month to do it in as well. Uranus is in Aries and rises uh, 22 minutes after midnight to 10.20 p.m. And then Neptune is in Aquarius, where it basically always is, and it rises at 10.30 p.m. to 8.30 p.m. over the course of the month. And that is what's up in the night sky. Uh, remember, we don't charge for this show, but we may tax your brain.